Hey folks, it's Andrew from Gimba Red, and today we'll be talking about how heat hinders penetration with red and near-infrared light therapy, and how cooling increases penetration. Now the concept is quite simple, is that heating promotes vasodilation, and when the skin senses heat, it's going to send more blood flow to that area to try to thermoregulate. And having more blood and water in those surface layers of the skin, those will be blocking and scattering more light, thus preventing the light from reaching the deeper tissues. And this is not just me saying this, this is not just some people extrapolating and connecting the dots. This has been very clearly written word for word in peer-reviewed articles and PBM textbooks. Now there seems to be another phenomenon that's causing less penetration when there's heat, is that the tissue optical properties seem to be changing with heat, and that's also adding to the reduction of penetration and more superficial absorption. Now one interesting perspective is that the opposite is also true, is that cooling the skin also increases penetration. Because now cooling the skin promotes vasoconstriction and there'll be less blood flow in the area. Sometimes if you do a cold plunge or if your skin's very cold, you could look down at your skin and it appears to be more transparent. You can see your veins more clearly. And that is true for red and near-infrared light. You get better transmission through the skin. And one example I'll go over here is that on living humans, they iced the Achilles tendon and they found about 25% increase of penetration through the Achilles tendon. And it's really important that they're doing these penetration studies on living humans because a lot of times the penetration studies are done on isolated tissues, on cadaver tissues, dead tissues, so they may be lacking the blood flow, they're lacking the dynamic effects of heating on the living tissue. So they're seeing these effects more often on living humans, which we don't have a lot of studies for, but all the studies that do happen to do this, they start to notice the effects of cold and heat on living whole humans. And so like I said, this is a very simple concept and there are a lot of great practical applications that we can use to improve our red light therapy, our penetrations, and to make red light therapy generally safer. And the first tip is to use non-thermal parameters for photobiomodulation as that is the definition and that's why we don't see this discussed very much in the photobiomodulation research is that most of the parameters are non-thermal. So that means we're using low intensities, low doses, the red to near infrared range that we're using are already some of the least heating wavelengths on the solar spectrum, so that's not a coincidence. And then as studies move on into higher intensities or even longer wavelengths, that's when the pulsing techniques become more important, the scanning techniques or other external cooling like using cooling gels, pre-cooling the skin with cryotherapy or ice, or you just using a cooling fan on yourself. You don't want to do your sauna or your exercise before red light therapy because then you've heaten yourself up and you've got more blood flow and that's going to hinder the deep penetration. And that's where it becomes problematic where there's marketing for those full spectrum saunas and they're incorporating more near infrared into their far infrared saunas and they're claiming all the PBM benefits uh, but then you're not really getting that penetration, you're not really dosing it correctly and so I always recommend doing your red light therapy separate from your infrared sauna. And we can think about how this relates to our exposure to natural sunlight and evolution, as that a lot of people have told me over the years that sunlight feels warm, and that's why it's okay for photobiomodulation to be warm. Which that comes from the naturalistic fallacy that we assume that natural things are healthier for us or better for us, which is generally true, but we do want to verify it with clinical studies and evidence. A lot of times for various forms of drugs or therapies, we are doing unnatural things to get a stronger therapeutic response. So you think about supplements that are taken orally, you have to deal with the gastrointestinal juices, breaking them down, and the intestinal absorption. But if you take your supplements in an unnatural way, like with an IV or a suppository, or even in like a liposomal form, then that can improve absorption and you can get a stronger therapeutic effect. And so perhaps the reason why we don't overdose out in sunlight is because one sunlight is non-contact and two sunlight is warming us up with those longer wavelengths and even the shorter wavelengths that get superficially absorbed. And so our skin is going to try to protect our sensitive organs that have higher mitochondrial counts and those are more sensitive to the biphasic dose response. And so the heat is going to close up your optical window of your skin and reduce the penetration of that light because it's trying to protect our deeper tissues, our muscles, and our organs that have more mitochondria that could be shut down functionally 
due to overdose. And so the reason why we don't overdose from sunlight is because it's non-contact and the heat effects will shut down penetration. So typically the worst thing that can happen if you spend too much time in the sun is to cause some skin issues. And it's no coincidence the same thing is happening with a lot of people using overpowered LED panels that are causing a lot of heat, they're getting a lot of superficial absorption, and most of the adverse reactions that are being reported are superficial issues like burns and melasma and rosacea and hyperpigmentation. And so you see that correlation that we're not actually overdosing the deep tissue, we're only damaging our skin with a false promise of deeper tissue. And so if we actually think these things through when people make that rhetorical argument about sunlight, we see our footprint is minimized when the sun is overhead because we stand upright as opposed to a lizard is always sprawled out because they're cold blooded and they need to absorb that sunlight and that warmth. And naturally, if we feel a lot of heat and a lot of warmth from sunlight, we're going to seek the shade. And then even in the shade, we're a little bit cooler and the greenery is still reflecting a lot of the near infrared back to us while we're staying in a cooler condition. And of course, a lot of the top health influencers are telling you to get your sunlight in the early morning. In the evenings, that's when there's proportionally more red and near infrared because the UV and the blue light is being filtered out by the angle of the atmosphere. And so we're actually very well attuned to be absorbing red and near infrared light while we're relatively cooler and we're minimizing our absorption during midday and during the hottest part parts of the day. And if you even go back to the old heliotherapy clinics, a lot of them were preferentially located in the mountains or in cooler climates that there seemed to be some synergy with the cold climate and the sunlight. So as usual, that rhetorical argument about sunlight being warm, we can break it down and show you that the therapeutic aspects of sunlight are usually when we are cooler. And I can remember a long time ago when there was a lot of hype around red light therapy and cold thermogenesis, that CT. And so a lot of the top biohackers were talking about this a long time ago, that they were purposely combining cold thermogenesis and red light therapy. While you're nice and cold, I want to get you right into the red charger. You can really get the benefits most when you're cold. So we can see even Dave Asprey was promoting this idea to do your cold thermogenesis beforehand and then do the red light therapy for some vague reasons that it optimizes your absorption or your benefits to do your cold before your red light therapy. And I would be remiss to mention that a lot of this traces back to Dr. Jack Cruz. Yeah, and I've mainly been cold plunging in the morning, but I'm going to try that evening now. I mean, I'll still probably use it in the morning because, like, I try to use it in the morning and then get some sunlight. Because you mentioned, David Herrera mentioned that, like, if you get in the cold, you'll be able to absorb more sunlight, mm -hmm. right? So I'm still going to do that, but... Like here's the Mark Bell podcast and they're recapping after talking to Jack Cruz about how they think that, you know, doing the cold before your sunlight helps Im improve absorption for some vague reasons. And a lot of you probably weren't following the industry at this time, but Jack Cruz specifically had a product that was combining photobiomodulation and cold therapy in a little wrist device. And I also invented uh, a light and cooling device that fits on your wrist called the Quantlet. You can find out more about that at thequantlet.com. Um, that's pretty much me. And of course, Jack Cruz will have some more quantum reasons for why this is happening. But myself as an engineer, I don't like getting trapped in the quantum realm. I kind of look at the bigger picture and the macro picture, and maybe things are a little bit more simple. Maybe our skin transparency improves when we are cold. Maybe, you know, it reduces the ROS buildup when we have too much heat and red light therapy, and that can mitigate a lot of the adverse reactions that people are experiencing. A lot of times it's not necessarily the intensity or the dose that is the problem, it is the heat. So as long as you can control the heat, you could still enjoy high intensities and high doses. It's probably still not the optimal way to dose, but at least you won't be causing 5% adverse reactions in your customers. And that would be a lot safer. And again, I just want people to be able to use red light therapy the most effective way possible and the safest way possible. And combining a cooling fan and a red light therapy device is very simple. It's a no brainer. You don't have to stop using high intensity. If that's your thing, then go for it. But I just want people to be able to use it safer. You're going to reduce that ROS. You're going to improve your penetration of your light and you're going to have a better experience with less adverse reactions in the long run. So that's my bit for today. Thanks for tuning in.